Dear dear Father, thank you for the time that we get to spend with you in your house today. We just ask that you'll be with Jack as he gives a message to us. Let it go out these walls and into the world. Whether it be listening to you and we spread the word or whether it's from the video, we just ask that you'll be with him and have the words that you want him to say brought to us. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Well said. Uh, I'm going to turn to Mark 14. Actually, I already have turned to Mark 14. I'm, there's no way I'm going to get through this whole chapter, so I'm going to try to pick a natural break. And one thing about the Gospel of Mark, the chapters are long, and it's like a condensed soup that you have to add water to. So I'm not going to water it down. That's not what I'm saying. But I like the idea of going step by step, verse by verse, and not going through this chapter as a, a marathon or a run. I want to walk slowly through each verse. So I'm only going to go through halfway through Mark uh, because this could take a long time. And if we have somebody at window sills, you remember the guy that fell out of the window sill who mm -hmm. Paul was preaching to? And, you know, we won't go that far. But yeah. this chapter is really an interesting thing. Also, I wanted to mention last time about Jesus gave the prophets. Did you know that Nostradamus stole some of the prophecies of the Bible and that's how he became so famous. He studied the Bible, looked at the prophecies and claimed them for his own. I got a question this morning about Nostradamus and I, I says, uh, well, he's, he's just a thief and he came up with nothing original. I'm telling the truth. That's, that's the fact. They don't hear that, but that's the truth. So I just wanted to make sure and I left that out last time uh, when he was speaking in the uh, the Olivet Prophecy, but in Mark 14, verse 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover. That means in two days the Passover is coming. And the unleavened bread and the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. That is, they did not want the public to know. Imagine the uproar if they came up and took Jesus. If he was teaching in the temple, there would be a riot. Because at this time, Jesus was still more popular uh, than probably John the Baptist by now. And he had a huge following. But, but they said in verse 2, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. The people would pretty well rebel against this and they would uh, not, it would probably cause a riot because Jesus was thought of as uh, very highly at that time. So being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, now, he's no leper no more. Remember the guy that was healed from leprosy? He's coming back into the story. Now he's going to uh, host a meal. And, and it's kind of interesting because uh, lepers at that time were put outside of the camp and outside of the city and were thought to be unclean because of their own sins. But being in Bethany in the house there, uh, he sat at me and came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke open the box and poured it from her on his head. Spikenard is a pure nard oil. It's you import it. Well, we were talking about this in Sunday school. It comes from India, Nepal, and China. One way export out. Remember you were talking about that, and that's true. This is a very precious ointment. This may have been her dowry. So we're talking about, in fact, it tells they were very angry at this. And there were some that were indignant with her. They were very angry. They were outraged. Indignish. Indignation means a, a form of anger that is almost out of control. They couldn't contain themselves because of this. And they said, why is this waste of this ointment made? They cannot believe that they are wasting this ointment on Jesus uh, for something, but they didn't understand. They said it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. 300 pence. A pence is about a day's wages. We're talking about a year's wages. And for a, what apparently was a widow or a single woman, that was her, that's all she had. And maybe the day had passed where uh, her flowering age where she's not no longer going to be married and had given up on that. But this is an extravagant gift of all that she had. Uh, you know, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. That is, we're talking probably roughly 
I would say $27,000, $30,000 a year, as from what I could understand. So this is not a small amount. For, in today's wages, I'm talking about, okay, if you're working today. They murmured against her. Same word that Israel murmured against uh, God, grumbling. They were grumbling against her. And Jesus said to her, verse 9, to them, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? She's did a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whatever you will, you may do to them good. But me you will not have always. So she has done what she could and came beforehand to anoint my body for burial. She came beforehand, meaning ahead of time. Now, I don't think that they were hearing that. This was for his burial. They kept hearing that, but they were afraid to ask. He, I don't know how many times he's told them that the Son of Man is going to go up to Jerusalem and be killed and by the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and all. So this is kind of amazing that during this, they're worried about a small amount of money. And verse 9, Jesus says, and this is, this is awesome, Wherever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. It's just been fulfilled. It was just fulfilled. I spoke to it about her. So this memorial has been known about her. This prophecy has now been fulfilled in your hearing and others uh, because it has came true. And here is a turning point for Judas. Look, it's a, it's a hinge. Verse 10. Mark 14, verse 10. And, meaning it's a conjunctive thought. Okay, this happened now, this is next, okay? These are connected. The old conjunction function, you know, they use one pulls and it's attached to the other. Judas and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. I believe this may have been Judas' breaking point because he saw that Jesus is not going to be a political Jesus. There's no political Messiah. He's not going to be a social gospel preacher. And so Judas had hope for a political Messiah to take over. When he saw that that was not going to happen, Jesus, he just said that he's going to die, remember. Judas was, I believe, turned the point of no return because he went out to betray Jesus. It's like he's saying, I've had it with this Jesus. He's not what I thought he would be, and he's not going to uh, overcome the Roman guards uh, and, or the empire to take back Israel. That's all they were interested in, a political Messiah, not one with a relationship with God or Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Just a side note there, and I think that may have been the turning point of Judas. He'd had enough. Before this, I don't know. This may have been too much. Verse 11, and when they heard it, they, they, the, the religious leaders, the chief priests, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought out how he might conveniently betray him. He sought out and he thought out and then he bought out. Jeez. In other words, he thought about where is, where is a good place where Jesus will be isolated and it would be in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's why he thought about it because the crowds would not be there, because they feared the crowds by taking him in the temple. So, they were thinking about it. They're going to be a little bit of a, a, a skullduggery, a kind of a cloak and dagger kind of thinking. They're going to wait until he's in a vulnerable place by himself with outside of the crowd. Now it changes gears. And on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, the word killed is, called, is actually sacrificed. His disciples said to him, Where will you that we go and prepare to eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples and said to him, Go into the city, and there you will meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. Now imagine that. Jesus is telling these guys, Okay, go into the city, and when you find a guy with a pitcher of water, follow him. That shows the sovereignty of God. They came in at the town at the exact moment that this man was walking by with a pitcher of water uh, and or a, a, had water with him. So the timing that he knew exactly when to send them out. Now, they're thinking, you know, we're going to find a guy with a pitcher. When they got in town, they saw him. And he says, wherever he goes, say to the good man of the house, the master says, where is the guest chamber, verse 14, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. 
So they're supposed to go in town, they see a guy carrying water, and they just follow him. Okay, that's what he told them to do. And they followed him. And what happens here? He showed them an upper large room furnished and prepared there, ready for us. It had already been prepared. <clears throat> Except for maybe the love feast might, might have been but everything was prepared. Jesus had planned this ahead of time, obviously, uh, with maybe outside of the scripture, we don't hear anything about that. Well, obviously, he's made preparations ahead of time. And his disciples went forth and came into the city, verse 16, and found it as he said to them, and they made ready for the Passover. In other words, it was just exactly what Jesus said. And in the evening, he came with the twelve. This is past sunset now. In the evening, it's right at the sunset. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Most assuredly, one of you which eats with me shall betray me. Now, not everybody threw up their hand. I know who it is. I think, oh, I bet you I know It's the guy next to Look at the guy down at the end. It's nothing like that. He said, Jesus said, Verily, it is that one of you which eats with me will betray me. And now, verse 19, Then they began to be sorrowful and say to him one by one, Is it me? Another said, Is it I? Believe it or not, they thought it might have been them because they're thinking the pressure when they come, they might have thought they might have caved in under pressure and they would have betrayed him. So every one of them didn't, th they didn't know Judas was going to be the betrayer. They had no idea. This is obviously, if they're thinking it could have been them, then they had no clue. And think about that. If you came under a pressure situation, like a, like a Muslim I just spoke with, where they threatened to take your life, and his response was, fine, I'll be in the presence of the Lord. That's what, I won't even say his name, but that's what he said. But not all of us would react that way, I don't think. I don't know if I would react that way. Would I betray Christ with my mouth when they said, if you deny Christ, I'll let you live? We, we don't know that unless we're placed in that situation. This guy was so enamored by Christ that he was willing to go right away because he knew to be absent from the body, present with the Lord, even if his head was left behind. Okay, they were threatening to take his head off. He didn't care. He had so much passion for, the, for Christ that he was willing to do that. And I don't know that these other uh, the apostles at this time were ready to do that. He answered to them, It is one of the twelve, verse 20, that dips with me in the dish. If you've seen the Passover meal, they don't really have chairs. They sat around uh, on the floor with cushions, and they sat next to each other, and they had a big sop dish, which is a big soup bowl-like kind of, that they would have in the middle, or they might have a couple of them. So they're all thinking, Man, I just shared. He's, they're going to all share this, okay? So keep that in mind. They all dipped their bread in that, the unleavened bread in it. So they all did it. So I, it could have been me, okay? Don't lose that fact because they are, they've heard him talk about he's going to die. He's been anointed for death. And they know he's not going to uh, overcome the Roman authorities by now. Even the, uh, the 11 faithful apostles knew that. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him which means we're talking about uh, prophets and the Psalms and Zechariah. But what he, that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, verse 21, it would be better for him if he'd never been born. Absolutely true. Now, with Jude, there's an idea that Judas was prophesied that he had no choice but to betray Christ. But there's human, the free will in there. He had a choice. He could have repented and, and the difference between Peter denying Christ and Judas denying Christ is Peter grieved and repented and cried and Judas was angry uh, and there was some remorse that he had failed. There was a lot of more than that. It was not that he could have not repented. He could have, but he chose not to repent. And as they ate, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Here's the reason why. The guy I heard from last night asked me, he said, he's got an online church, and he's listened to us, and he's got another online church. And I says, your online church will not be able to reach out of the screen to hand you the bread and the wine, okay, the juice. So the ordinances are important for the body to gather. An online church cannot do that. Yeah, there's, no, there's no church discipline. 
there's no sacraments. Uh, you can't get baptized. Water and computers don't work very good. Your online churches, you know, well, he's my virtual pastor and he's my, well, when you're in a hospital, have your virtual pastor go bitch at you, okay? He doesn't exist. This is why the body is essential. Martin Luther said, whoever does not have his, the church for his mother does not have God as his father because this is the sheepfold and... Uh, that this just a side note because I get angry at issues that all churches are now apostate and none of them are preaching the gospels. Have you been to every church? No. You can't say a sweeping accounts about that. Uh, it's just not true. Anyway, tangent, sorry. Verse 23, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and he drank of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verse 24, many is not all, because that's not universalism. You know, there are many paths to God, you believe, then Jesus died for nothing. I'm sorry, you're wrong. There, this is for uh, not all, but the many for who would, in fact, Mark 10, 45, we read earlier, that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, he wouldn't give his life as a ransom there was an inmate who refused to have parole. He was I'm a pardon, and he said, "No, I'm going to stay here." The pardon was available just as it was for Judas, but you got to accept it, and, and Judas didn't. And not all will accept it. I'm probably not going to go much further because it changes context. I will try to finish this paragraph at Mark 14, verse 24, or verse 25. I beg your pardon. Most assuredly, I say to you, I will not drink any more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Actually, this is the best translation, fruit, the vine. It's, it's not wine, okay? This is unleavened, it's the days of unleavened bread, and they're not going to have wine which has yeast in it and fermented. So this is basically uh. juice, okay? The idea that Jesus would create wine with yeast during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is it's against the grain. It ain't going to happen. So the idea that they're drinking wine is false. It is juice. Okay. I want to clear that up. I heard Dr. McGee just speak on that last weekend. And uh, so it makes no sense that at the wine, at the, the party he would produce wine and they would get a buzz, or at the Passover meal, that's outrageous. You see why? That this is juice. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Which hymn was that? I think that it may have been Psalm 23. Psalms and hymns are interchangeable. Psalms were songs. Uh, some of them were praise songs. Uh, it could have been Psalm 23. I'm only guessing. But what hymn that was, I don't really know. I can only speculate. But Psalm 23 would seem to fit because he's in the shout of the valley of death. And he, he, fear, he fears no evil because the Lord is with him. Uh, so I don't know if that was it or not, uh, but it, I believe it's one of the psalms that they sang because they created hymns out of the psalms. Verse 26, and, and when they sang that hymn, they went out in the Mount of Olives. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to get through this next section and close with that because Jesus here is going to make them completely sorrowful. And he said, all of you, verse 27, Mark 14, all of you will be offended because of me this night. The word offended does not necessarily mean, man, you said something and I'm mad. You made me mad. That is more of, uh, what I want to say, resisting persecution because they knew they would have got, they might have been next. You know, they were trying to avoid being caught up with that. Uh, so it'll explain more why the word offended may not be the best word of all, but they were offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And Zechariah 13, 7, is, that's a reference he quoted. That's a prophecy of Zechariah 13, verse 7. And they did scatter. And after he was risen, I will go before you in Galilee. Now he'd already told him he's going to die. He's going to be uh, delivered to the scribes and the chief priests. And now he says again, He's going to be smitten. They understand the word smite is pretty much, it's going to be death. After that, I'm going to be risen from the dead. And I'll go before you in Galilee. He's already told them ahead of time. 
that I'm going to be, they're going to kill me, I'm going to be raised, and then I'm ancient Galilee. They, what were they doing when they heard it? No, 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 no. They didn't hear that. And he's plainly told them either they were afraid to ask, uh, probably more afraid to ask because they thought uh, this just doesn't sound like the Messiah that we had been reading about in the Old Testament. It's not what they expected. And the Messiah was expected to reign forever. But Peter said to him, although I be offended, yet will I not. I, I wrote that wrong. Even though everyone else in this room is offended, Peter's raising his, I won't. Oh, should have been a bad choice of words, Peter, because that he spoke the more vehemently that if I should, if I should, I will die with you. I will not deny you, verse 31, by any way or by any means. And likewise, all the others said the same thing, but that was after Peter. So it's easy to say that in that closed group where they're uh, protected and Jesus is with them and they felt probably a safeness with Jesus. So they, I'll, I'll close with this section here. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane, which was in our hymn this morning, our song. I thought I'd find it appropriate. He came to Gethsemane and said to his disciples, stay here for a while while I pray. And he took them with him, Peter, James, and John. Those are the three close circles. Those are the like the three amigos kind of to Jesus. Those are the ones that are really closer uh, then they took the member, they took these three up to uh, when they had Transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration. These guys are really close, uh, closer to the other one. Maybe it was because he took them, he told them, Don't say anything after you've seen the Mount. They kept their mouth shut. So he trusted them uh, to not say anything more. There are several reasons why those were in his inner circle. So he took them and he said to us, Stay here. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, verse 33, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. Sore amazed is, is actually saying in exceeding agony. He knew what was ahead. And sorrowful to death. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to death. Stay here and watch. Watch for who? Watch for the mob to come? Or watch Jesus? I don't know. I think more of that is just to stay awake because, and he had a trouble with him staying awake. But why is he so heavy laden? Think about all the sins that have created in all humanity for all history, and the ones that are being committed right now and day, and the ones that will be created, the sins that will be happening for eternity at the kingdom of God with, with, uh, will grow with no end. That means that he's going to take every sin that has ever been sinned upon his own self and it would be it is such a so opposite of Jesus nature that I don't think we can understand so he went forward a little while on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him and he verse 36 said Abba Father all things are possible to you take away this cup nevertheless not what I will but what you will here is the cup of human depravity with all the sins and debauchery and the most evil, wicked things you could think of, he's going to drink it. And we have stuff in that cup. Okay, you understand? We were part of that cup. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter and Simon, Are you sleeping? Couldn't you watch with me one hour? And again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. Three times Jesus prayed to the Father. Three times the Father said no. Three times Jesus said, your will, not mine. So well, I get irritated by it. If you pray enough, pray and pray in faith, it's going to happen. Hey, God said no to Jesus three times. Paul, the thorn in the flesh, no, three times. God has answered my, not an he did answer, and it was no. God always answers prayer. But thankfully, he did not answer this request because Jesus knew. Let's wrap this section up here and I'll finish with this before they come and get him. And he returned and he found him sleeping again for their eyes were heavy. Let me say something. When Pastor Dave passed away for the first day or two, I was so exhausted from 
grief. And, and it just rang me up. And maybe that's why their eyes were heavy. They knew Jesus was going to die. They knew where he was going to be taken away. And, and they worried about their own betrayal of him, remember. They're still, that's still in their mind. So that may be why their eyes were heavy. Neither did they know what to answer. They didn't know what to say to Jesus. And he came to them the third time, and I'll stop there, and, rose, and said to them, sleep on. It's okay, just sleep on. Take your rest. It's enough because the hour has come, verse 41. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And, okay, Jesus, and I'll stop there. Jesus was betrayed and put into the hands of sinners. Those were my hands. I was in that cup. And Judas didn't recognize that. If Judas had betrayed, so I, part of the reason I want to go to Lorna was because the last time I was there, they had a wicked witch, one of them not converted, took communion, and, the, and they didn't know that. I thought the guy was part of the church. Oh, this is another wicked. He should have never had that, that man. And I'm wondering about him now, and I'm worried about the church leadership because they should have caught that. Yeah, it comes right in, and you want the communion. Now, the deacons, that's why I need to have a meeting with them. That they've understood what the body and the blood or the, the juice is all about. And because it's easy, you know, these men, that man is still a sinner, and he can't be protecting them communion. So that's, that's one of those things that made me think of that. That Judas betrayed, and maybe at times we can betray him by our silence, but. We were all sinners, and Jesus was delivered into the hands of sinners who died for us. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for this lesson and showing us the passion of the Christ and that his will was that he died for us. Not that he felt like it or he wanted to or something he looked forward to. No, in his humanity, he knew this would be difficult and exceedingly agony on the cross, but also bearing the sins of those who frankly did not deserve God's mercy. We ask your blessing upon those who are listening and on those who were on the prayer request this week. And we ask your blessing upon us to return us safely next week that we might worship you again. In Christ's holy, righteous name we pray. Thank you.